Okay, good morning, uh, everyone. I'm Alan Barrett, the director of the ESRI, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this morning's webinar, uh, which is titled Unequal Chances, Inequalities in Mortality uh, in Ireland. So um, this morning, we're launching uh, a new report on the uh, the topic of inequalities in mortality. So the work has been undertaken by uh, my ESRI colleagues, uh, but funded by our uh, friends at the Institute uh, of Public Health. Uh, so I guess the first thing I want to do is uh, ju just thank the, uh, the IPH uh, for collaborating with the ESRI on this particular study. So I think you'll all uh, have the program, so you'll all be aware of uh, what we're going to do. In a few moments, I'll be uh, inviting uh, Suzanne Costello of the, um, the Institute of Public Health to say a few words, then the ESRI team uh, will go through the details uh, of the study, it's my, my colleagues Anne Olin and Bertrand Maitre, uh, then we'll have a couple of, of responses, uh, some observations from Dr. Ellen McAvoy, who's Director of Policy at the, uh, the IPH, and we'll also have Professor Dermot uh, O'Reilly. Uh, who's with the Centre for Public Health at the Queen's University, Belfast, uh, who who will make some comments as well. Um, hopefully, we'll have a bit of time. We're sort of scheduled to go from now till about a quarter past 12. Hopefully, we'll have some time uh, for Q&A. And if thoughts strike you during the course of the discussion, uh, feel free to enter those comments into the, uh, the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screens. And uh, I'll do my best then to moderate uh, some of the questions. I was thinking actually just, just in, in, in preparing, I think probably the first time uh, I attended a, a seminar on, on the, the topic of inequalities uh, in, in mortality many, many years ago, I think this is probably about 35 years ago, uh, but I always remember the speaker then motivating uh, the discussion with the observation uh, that on the Titanic, uh, your, your chances of survival were actually very, very closely related to your uh, social status. And again, I think we've all seen the various movies and read the various reports, uh, but to the extent that the first class passengers uh, made it out first and the third class folks uh, made it out last, uh, that you had this sort of real microcosm uh, of inequalities in, in, in mortality. Um, that was an interesting way of motivating uh, the topic. But of course, I mean, in many ways, we do, we do lots of work in the ESRI on various dimensions of inequality. Uh, but really, when you think about it, uh, there, there probably is no sort of more fundamental uh, indicators of inequalities in the world uh, than inequalities uh, in, in mortality. Uh, we can think about that in a global sort of sense, and I think people are, are very aware of it, but I often think people are probably less aware uh, of differences in um, mortality that exist uh, on, on the island of Ireland uh, it, it itself. Uh, so always an important, always an interesting study, and it's, it's great, again, that, that some really, really good and useful research insights have, have been uncovered uh, by, by my ESRI colleagues. So I won't take up uh, any more time uh, right now, uh, but it is my pleasure uh, to welcome Suzanne Costello to the, uh, to the webinar, and uh, look forward to your remarks, Suzanne. Thank you, Alan, and good morning, everyone. We are delighted today by the publication of Unequal Chances, Inequalities and Mortality in Ireland. Next year, the Institute of Public Health marks its 25th anniversary, and it's fitting that this report on inequalities and mortality is published in time for that milestone, especially as this report was commissioned as a partial follow-up to the Institute's well-known 2001 report on inequalities and mortality on the island of Ireland. As you may know, the Institute was established in 1998 as a North-South agency at the instigation of the Chief Medical Officers in Ireland and Northern Ireland and supported by their respective Departments of Health. The Institute's focus was and remains to inform public health policy to reduce health inequalities and improve health equity on the island of Ireland. Then, as now, it was recognised that the potential for cross-border cooperation for public health is significant and continues to grow. Since 1998, emphasis on health improvement has increased. The development of national strategies such as Healthy Ireland and Slaunch Care in Ireland and Making Life Better in Northern Ireland reinforce the importance of building healthier populations for personal, societal and economic well-being. The challenges to achieving this are common across the island of Ireland and there is mutual benefit in close cooperation and in some cases alignment and we have lots to learn from each other. However, in Ireland, to assess need to design, prioritise and evaluate the range of measures required to support everyone to reach their potential for optimal health and well-being, we need a detailed understanding of what is happening at local, regional and national level. I am so pleased that this report crystallises both what we know about inequalities and mortality in Ireland, but also what we need to know. 
Public health recognizes that the primary determinants of disease are economic and social, and therefore the remedies must be both economic and social. The recent and continuing crises have starkly indicated that maintaining population health and well-being reaches far beyond the remit of the healthcare services, essential though they are to our society, and that public health should be a central consideration to those who devise economic and social policy more broadly. This report will, I hope, help to progress that ambition. Finally, it has been a pleasure to work with the ESRI, and I would like to thank Alan, Anne, Bertrand, Sheila and Katie for their work in producing this report. We are especially grateful for the input of the Research Programme Committee, Dr. Paul Kavanagh from the HSE, Professor Richard Lake from Trinity College Dublin, Professor Dermot O'Reilly from Queen's University, and our own Director of Policy at the Institute, Dr. Helen McAvoy. You will hear from both Dermot and Helen very shortly. I would particularly like to acknowledge my colleague, Helen, who is the instigator of this report. Her experience of high-level policy work in Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the wider UK and Europe means she is aware of the opportunities available to us should we pursue a more comprehensive approach to public health data in Ireland. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Suzanne. And um, again, it's been a pleasure for us to work, to work with you and your colleagues. So and great, great to get uh, to where we are today, uh, having the report to launch. So uh, move straight on now. Uh, I think it's, uh, two of my colleagues are going to do the presentation, Bertrand Maitre uh, and Anne Nolan. And uh, my understanding is, Bertrand, that you're going to kick off the discussion. So, Absolutely. and again, I'm just go just going to remind people uh, that if questions do strike you uh, as Bertrand and Anne uh, are talking, feel free to enter those uh, questions uh, as we go along. So, Bertrand, over to you. Okay, thanks, Alan. So, I'm just going to share my screen, and I'm just going to ask you if you can see my screen. Yeah, we, just we, hold we, on. we can see it. Yep. Yeah, I'm just going to need to do that in two full size. And is that okay? Perfect, Bertrand. Yep, that's, that's great. Thanks very much. Okay, so um, so I'm presenting today the the, the results of this uh, this report. You know that Susan has mentioned inequalities in mortality in Ireland. And just before starting, I want as well, you know, just to reiterate, you know, the, our thanks to the Institute of Public Health for funding this piece of work. And I want to thank as well the Central Statistics Office for supplying the data on which the analysis uh, is being based. Uh, so I'm presenting uh, this morning on behalf of my uh, colleagues, uh, Katie Duffy and Sheila Connolly. And as uh, you mentioned, uh, Alan, I'm just going to start um, the presentation and halfway you know, on uh, with, with takeover. So um, in order to uh, estimate and monitor social progress uh, within societies, governments, uh, uh, international organizations, you know, such as the World Health Organizations, and as well, you know, researchers like us, are, are using, you know, quite extensively uh, two key uh, health indicators like the life expectancy and uh, mortality rates. And when we see that um, across you know, most of the uh, societies in the world, we see that you know there's a huge improvement in the reduction, you know, of uh, mortality rates uh, uh, within societies. But we see as well that, you know, that in spite of the fact that, you know, there was this very large reductions, we see that, you know, uh, those reductions have not been experienced, you know, to the same extent uh, across groups within society. So this is really kind of a, 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 an important, you know, uh, policy concern, you know, uh, because um, beyond the fact that, you know, this is being seen as ethically being unfair as well, you know, we, we know that, you know, some of those, you know, inequality, you know, could be uh, avoided. And so there's really some potential just to reduce those inequality. Uh, so as um, Helen has mentioned as well just earlier on, I think, you know, what we're doing today uh, with this report, so we're just, you know, updating some of the work that has been done previously by the Institute of Public Health. Um, so that was, you know, a little bit more than 20 years ago. So very briefly, what we're going to do this morning, so we're just going to present uh, some of the key findings on first, we're going to look at, you know, um, the trend uh, in terms of early life and mortality rates, uh, roughly between 2000 and, and 2018, 2019. Um, when we're going to focus in terms of inequalities as well, we're going to look at trend over time, and we're going to look at, you know, inequalities um, between socioeconomic groups, but as well, uh, in terms of ethnicity, country of birth and nationality. 
and particularly, you know, on perinatal and adult mortality. And finally, we're going to focus as well on uh, inequalities in relation to uh, COVID-19. Okay, and again, looking at the cross socioeconomic groups and, and ethnic groups. So, as I mentioned just earlier on as well, you know, as a way to thank uh, the Central Statistics Office here, we're using a very wide range of administrative uh, data uh, coming uh, from the CSO. Uh, and, and those data have been, you know, um, gathered together, but, you know, the, there is some issue in terms of uh, using that data because, you know, some of the coding system being used sometimes, you know, uh, can be, uh, can differ, uh, for example, from the, um, the certificate of death record and what being done, for example, you know, in the census of population. So that has been quite challenging. And I presume we talk about that maybe at the end uh, in, in the question session. So just uh, going to talk first about, you know, adult mortality. So what we're showing here on this slide, we're looking at the standardized mortality rate uh, by gender uh, for the period 2000 and, and 2018. And we're looking at the standardized mortality rate because we want to take account of the fact that uh, when we're comparing two group of the population, so one group you know could be much younger, and of course that will have an impact on the risk of mortality. So we are standardizing you know those differences. So what we see here, we see that you know uh, across the period uh, 2000 to uh, 2018, we see that you know, there was a very sharp fall in the mortality rate you know across both genders. Um, there was, you know, uh, as you can see as well, that the mortality rate, you know, for male was much higher than it was uh, for female, and it stayed like that all, all the time. Uh, what we can see as well is that uh, in 2000, for example, uh, the mortality rate uh, for male was uh, was 1.5 times that of, of women. And in 2018, in fact, you know, the same gap, you know, still persisted. So I think it was 1.4. So there is well, there is a very large reduction in the mortality rate you know, from both genders, you know, the inequality uh, between those genders, you know, still persisted. So here we're looking at uh, the major cause of death. Um, and we just, you know, looking at the picture, uh, how it was in 2000 and 2018. This is the cause of death. Uh, are groups uh, into four groups, and this is the the groups you know that uh, uh, CSO are, are are using, and that you know that, that that we receive from CSO. So you can see that in 2000, you know, the main cause of death was due to uh, circulatory disease. Uh, just over 41 percent, you know, uh, of of those deaths were due to this uh, cause. And uh, followed then by cancer, uh, 25 percent, and more or less, you know, equally uh, respiratory and, and over. If we're looking at you no know, uh, in 2018, so there is you know very sharp fall uh, in terms of the cause of death due uh, to circulatory disease, and a slight increase to cancer, uh, going from 25 to 30 percent. Uh, a very small reduction as well due to respiratory disease, but a very large increase. Uh, in terms of the uh, non-classified order, okay, and this is due as well, you know, to uh, a very large increase in the absolute numbers of the of the of the over course, okay. So, in, in the next slide, now what we're looking at, we're looking at um, mortality rates across the economic groups, and here we're just focusing uh, for the later period, uh, 2014, 2018. In the report, we look at as well the period, you know, 20. Uh, to uh, 2000 uh, and to uh, 2012. And we're not showing that here because, you know, we're using, you know, two different uh, kinds of uh, socioeconomic groups. This is coming from the fact that, as I was mentioning earlier on, that the classification used in the first period is different to the most recent period. So we can't really put side by side uh, those two results. Um, we're doing that in the report, you know, separately, but here we're just focusing on the later period, okay? So um, you can see straight away uh, over time uh, from 2014 to 2018, that there is a very strong uh, social class, uh, socioeconomic gradients, you know, in terms of mortality, where uh, employers and managers, for example, have the lowest mortality rates, where the highest mortality rates is being experienced 
by uh, the manual skill to agricultural workers and as well all of us can fully occupy it and then no one. And that's true across all the years. So there's no change at all. We still observe you know, this huge level of inequality uh, across socioeconomic groups. If we're looking at as well over time between 2014 and 2018, we can see that the numbers are quite small here, but we can see as well that there's still a reduction in the mortality rates uh, for uh, the top groups like employers and managers and higher level professionals. So all the groups have experienced uh, a reduction in their mortality rates at the exception of the all of us can fully occupy the non -mode. And the reduction in fact, you know, was the largest for employers and managers. So if we're focusing now in terms of inequality, we can see that in fact, uh, the mortality rate for uh, the all of us can fully occupy the unknown is twice that the mortality rates of employers and managers. And that really stayed uh, more or less you know, the same across all the time, and even it increased in, in 2018. So focusing now uh, again on the cause of death uh, by socioeconomic groups, and here we're just looking at you know, 2018. So we have the four cause of death, cancer, circulatory, and respiratory, and all of the causes. Again, we can see again, the very strong uh, socioeconomic gradients uh, for cause of mortality. Uh, this is particularly clear for cancer. Again, we can see that you know, employers and managers have the lowest uh, mortality rate for this type of disease. That's true as well for circulatory, respiratory, and all of our causes again. And again, the group that has the largest uh, mortality rate for each of those uh, diseases <clears throat> are the all of us can fully occupied and unknown and the manual skilled to agricultural workers. And we found exactly the same kind of a ratio that all of us can fully occupied and unknown, you know, their uh, risk of cancer is twice that, for example, than uh, employers and managers, and that's true as well for circulatory, respiratory and all of our causes. So again, here, even across, you know, um, when we look at, you know, by type cause of death, we could see again, you know, that there is very strong uh, socioeconomic gradients uh, in terms of mortality rates. So now we're moving on to um, looking at the level of mortality rates and inequality uh, by uh, ethnicity. And this is uh, coming from a um, uh, an extra analysis that uh, the Central Statistics Office you know, did for us. So, because nationality, ethnicity, and country of birth are not collected in their free courts, um, CSO was able to match the death records to the census of population. And that's why we're presenting here numbers for 2016, 2017. And the Central Statistics Office were able to match 80% of, of death records you know, here for these ethnic groups. So we're comparing, you know, the mortality rates um, for the white Irish, so in blue here, and the black black Irish, Asian Asian Irish, and all of our, you know, uh, mixed backgrounds are not stated. So we can see here straight away that we either, you know, cross genders, but for the overall, that the mortality rate, you know, is much lower for the non-white uh, Irish. And that you know, can be explained by what we call you know, the healthy uh, in immigrant effect, where immigrants you know, tend to be healthier than, than the natives. And that's true in Ireland, but as well uh, in, in, um, more broadly in many other countries. So here, those were the results by ethnicity. And if we're looking at you know, the results by country of birth, again, we can see the same similar pattern. So again, the uh, mortality rates, it's much higher for Irish people than it is uh, for the UK and again you know for the rest of Europe it's lower than for the UK and Ireland and of course you know the mortality rate is even much lower for the rest of the world of the world and again this is you know can be explained uh, what by what we call this uh, LC, uh, immigrant effect so I'm going to finish now and here and I'm going to pass it on uh, to Anne okay thanks thank you uh, thanks very much, uh, Bertrand, and uh, good morning, everybody. So, um, as Bertrand said, I'm going to um, finish out the presentation by taking you through uh, the results uh, in relation to uh, early life mortality and some exploratory analysis that we've done um, on COVID-19 uh, mortality. And then I'm going to sum up um, uh, with uh, some uh, policy implications that arise um, from the research. So, 
Um, yeah, so I'll start first with um, some broad time trends in relation to uh, infant mortality. So uh, by infant mortality, uh, I mean uh, death in the first uh, year of life. Um, and this is a really sort of important indicator um, of population health and the social progress more generally. So um, as Bertrand said, this is a sort of a key indicator that national governments and international organizations would use uh, to compare across countries and also to compare across time uh, in terms of progress. So you'll see there, and um, this is data from the same source that Bertrand presented uh, on in relation to adult um, uh, data it's from the vital statistics from the central statistics office. You'll see there that there's been a steady reduction in the infant mortality rate um, uh, over time, so over the last 20 years in Ireland. Um, so at the moment, um, there's about three deaths per 1,000 uh, population um, in terms of infant mortality. And that compares really well uh, internationally. So we now have one of the lowest rates uh, in the European Union. Um, and we have lower rates even than our neighbours neighbour and um, the UK um, and also significantly lower than in the US where it's closer to, to six. Um, so, you know, really positive um, trends there. Um, what I'm presenting now next is focusing, um, I suppose, on an even earlier period uh, of life. And this is death um, in the first week of life. So unfortunately, in terms of infant mortality, most of the deaths um, actually occur um, uh, in the period very shortly after birth um, uh, or in the first week. Um, so what we are going to focus on in terms of inequalities for the, the next few slides as well is what we term perinatal mortality. And perinatal mortality is the sum of um, early neonatal deaths. So this is death in the first week of life um, for infants that are born alive and also stillbirths. Um, so you can see there the, the trends over time for each of these three rates um, uh, in Ireland over the last 20 years. Again, really positive um, trends overall here with the rates um, reducing over time. Um, there's a little bit of an uptake um, or an uptick in 2019, really difficult to infer anything um, from this um, without sort of more years of data, um, so we'll, we'll have to wait and see. So in terms um, of uh, moving on then to uh, inequalities, um, maybe the next slide, Bertrand. Um, what I'm presenting here um, is uh, data um, on perinatal mortality rates. Um, and I should mention that this data um, comes from the National Perinatal Reporting System, uh, which is administered by the Healthcare Pricing Office of the HSC. Um, and we'd really like to thank um, the HPO um, uh, and the team there um, uh, for providing us um, with these data and for us answering uh, numerous queries that we had. So basically, the, the NPRS, the National Perinatal Reporting System, uh, is a census of births. So every birth that occurs either in hospital or at home um, is recorded on this data set. And it's really detailed data. It's primarily designed to collect clinical information on the birth and on the mother. Um, but there's also some information on demographics and um, socioeconomic status. And that's what we use here to, to look at inequalities. So the indicator um, of socioeconomic status we have is it's derived from the occupation of the mother. So similar to what Bertrand presented um, on in relation to adults, it's using a different indicator and that's an issue that I'll return to at the, at the end. Um, but broadly here, what we do is we classify mothers on the basis um, of their occupation. We code that into a socioeconomic group um, and we show how the perinatal mortality rate um, differs across these groups. Um, Thankfully, the number of perinatal deaths is, is very low in Ireland, um, so we've had to aggregate um, years into sort of groups of years rather than looking individually um, at each year. So you'll see there there's sort of four broad time periods that we're looking at. And I suppose there's two main things to take out of this very busy chart. The first is that, you know, overall the mortality rates are, are falling over time. Um, so I would have shown that in the, in the slide previously. So the sort of bars are lower um, in the later period than they are in the earliest period. Um, but I suppose across each of those four time periods, there still are um, substantial um, significant inequalities across socioeconomic groups. Um, you'll see, for example, um, you know, the orange and red groups, the sort of manual um, uh, groups, have higher mortality rates um, uh, than those in higher professional um, occupations. And I suppose the two groups that stand out are really the unemployed um, and to a lesser extent those involved in home duties. And these are additional categories that are used by the NPRS. 
in terms of the unemployed group, for example, that translates into about twice um, uh, the risk of perinatal death for mothers that are unemployed relative to mothers that are in the most advantaged group, which is um, higher professionals. Um, next slide, then, for account, please. So secondly, then, we look at inequalities by country of birth. Um, Unfortunately, the NPRS um, does not collect information on ethnicity um, or, or nationality. So the sole indicator that we have here is based on country of birth. Um, uh, this indicator and um, this information only started to be collected from 2004. So you'll see there, there's, there's um, three broad time periods rather than the four that I would have presented um, earlier. And again, what this is presenting is um, perinatal mortality rates um, for these broad um, sort of country of birth groupings. Again, we've had to aggregate um, uh, country of birth into these broad categories um, uh, just to ensure that we have sufficient uh, sample size. So you can see there, um, again, over time, um, for most of the, the groups, um, uh, the rates of perinatal death um, are falling. Um, but really, I suppose what's striking here is the, the yellow um, column. So African-born mothers, um, across all of the time periods have significantly higher perinatal mortality rates. And there's also evidence that these inequalities between African-born mothers and, for example, Irish-born mothers um, who have lower rates, that that's actually widening over time. So a sort of broad reduction that you see in perinatal mortality rates is not being experienced by African-born mothers, and that's the reason why you see widening inequalities uh, over time. So again, you know, in relation to these inequalities and the socioeconomic inequalities, we can get uh, into the discussion, I suppose, as to what factors might be underlying these um, patterns and trends uh, in the discussion section. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, so um, what I'm going to move on to here is a very, as I mentioned, very exploratory analysis of uh, inequalities in relation to COVID-19. Um, so, uh, the data that we are using and um, uh, for this analysis is again from a different uh, source and um, so the data on uh, COVID-19 death is from uh, the computerized infectious disease reporting system which is maintained by the health protection surveillance center so um, we're all probably aware um, with this reporting system they were the uh, agency which is uh, tasked with um, reporting um, and collecting data on notifiable infectious diseases and COVID-19 is, is one of our latest ones. Um, so uh, basically any positive diagnosis um, of COVID-19 is recorded on that system. And if there's a death um, uh, due to COVID-19, um, that is also reported um, on that system. Um, so what we have managed to get, and I want to thank again the CSO um, uh, for, for working with us on this, they um, matched these uh, COVID-19 deaths on the CIDR system to, um, if possible, the respective census of population record for those individuals. Um, they achieved a 70% uh, match rate. Um, obviously, the, the census um, at the time was 2016, so you know, um, four or five years uh, previously, um, so there was a 70% match rate. And just to note as well that we're looking at um, deaths um, from COVID-19 over broadly the first three waves of the pandemic, so up to um, May of 2021. So this was a period when, you know, for most of this period, there were no vaccines um, and most of the population um, had been fully vaccinated. Um, so the methodology that we're using here, we're not presenting uh, mortality rates from COVID-19 like you would have seen for some of the other analyses. What we're doing here is sort of a very simple descriptive analysis, and this was um, an analysis and following a methodology that was developed by our colleagues um, in the migration team, actually, at the SRI, um, when they looked at sort of a different exposure um, to COVID-19 across um, occupational groups. Um, so broadly, what I'm showing you here are um, across socioeconomic groups, so again, using this sort of um, indicator of socioeconomic status that's derived from occupation, I'm showing you here in the in the yellow or the orange columns are the proportion of deaths that are in each of these socioeconomic groups. Um, and then the blue column then shows you the proportion of the over 65 population that is in these respective groups. We focus on that age group um, uh, because we know that most COVID-19 deaths occur in older age. 
And broadly, um, if there are no inequalities, if there would be no inequalities in the risk of COVID-19 death across socioeconomic groups, you would see these lines perfectly aligned. Um, uh, but there's sort of suggestive evidence here that that's not the case. So if you look at the more advantaged groups, like employers and managers or higher professionals or lower professionals, they seem to have sort of a lower share um, of COVID-19 deaths um, than their respective share in the over 65 population would suggest, similarly for the other sort of lower or least advantaged groups like the unskilled manual, uh, the relationship was switched. Um, so we've also been able, because we're using the census match data here, we've also been able to look at inequalities by ethnicity, country of birth and nationality. Um, and there's been quite a lot of discussion internationally, particularly um, in the US around um, sort of very substantial um, ethnic inequalities in relation to COVID-19 uh, mortality. And um, I suppose, thankfully, here um, we've had, um, because of, I suppose, the profile of our um, uh, ethnic minority groups and our migrant groups, um, they're predominantly uh, in the younger population. So we're really working with very small numbers here. So um, really, I suppose, these findings have been taken um, with a big health warning. Uh, but in general, if you look at the sort of right panel here, um, there's a little bit of evidence that maybe people who are born um, in the EU East, that they have a higher um, sort of share of COVID-19 deaths than their you know, share in the over 65s uh, population would suggest, and similarly for the non-EU or UK population. Um, but as I said, these are relatively and very small numbers. So um, we really, I think we need more data to be able to really definitively make conclusions about um, this uh, aspect of inequality. Um, so next, I'll move on just to sort of broadly summarise um, the sort of main sets of findings that, that Bertrand and I presented uh, this morning. So in relation to uh, adult mortality, um, uh, it's been you know, really positive, and I think it's important to point that out, that there's been strong improvement in overall um, mortality rates uh, over time. Um, but there's real difficulty in assessing trends in socioeconomic inequalities over time. Uh, we've gone into it in detail in the report, the difficulties we faced in um, you know, uh, looking at indicators of socioeconomic status, having consistent indicators over time, being able to calculate mortality rates and standardise for mortality rates over time. But even if you look at sort of the more recent years for which we could, you know, with consistent data, um, there's significant inequalities, um, uh, for example, between the manual groups and, and higher professional groups. Um, for the first time, we were able to do some analysis of ethnic and country of birth and nationality inequalities. Um, these data are only available for 2016 as a result of that matching exercise that was um, conducted by the CSO, but they're sort of um, broadly suggestive of a healthy migrant effect, um, which you see. Um, certainly in, in European countries, not so much in the, in the US. Um, in relation to early life mortality, again, um, good news in the sense that there's been strong improvement in both the infant mortality rate over time and the perinatal mortality rate over time. Um, but again, um, these improvements have not been experienced equally by all groups. Um, and there's particular concern, I think, over widening inequalities um, for African uh, born mothers. In relation to COVID-19 mortality, um, it's a very exploratory analysis and um, very descriptive, um, but there is a sort of an emerging suggestion um, of socioeconomic and ethnic inequalities um, in COVID-19 mortality. Um, so finally, then, I'm going to sum up with some uh, policy implications um, arising from the research. So um, and we've grouped them into sort of two broad um, categories, and the first concerns the identification of, of vulnerable groups within the population um, that require uh, further policy attention. So um, in the perinatal period, mothers in, in less advantaged socioeconomic positions and mothers born in Africa um, were found to be particularly vulnerable to, to perinatal um, deaths. Um, there's an obvious intersection and interaction between socioeconomic status and ethnicity. Um, and that does explain some, but not all, of the vulnerability of African-born mothers. So even when we control for socioeconomic status, they still have an elevated risk of perinatal death. Um, these sort of findings in relation to African-born mothers have been found, for example, in the UK. Um, and there's been quite a good bit of research done on what those additional factors might be. Is it 
differential access to healthcare, difficulty in navigating the healthcare system, is it due to more local environmental uh, factors, just for exposure to air pollution? And um, so certainly there's a plenty of scope here, I think, to, to drill down into these a little bit more for further research. Um, for adults, then, we find that those in less advantaged socioeconomic positions have higher standardized mortality rates. Um, again, really important, I think, to try and understand why this is the case. Um, is it due to material resources? So to people in lower socioeconomic positions, is it purely due to the fact that they have less income, lower levels of wealth? Um, is it due to access to healthcare? Is it due to differences in health behaviours across groups? Or is it due to sort of other flexible resources like, you know, as I said before, like the ability to navigate the systems of healthcare and social care education system? Um, and I suppose these really point to the, the importance of the broader social determinants of health. Um, and this is the framework that says that we should focus on the conditions in which people live um, and sort of widen our focus um, when we're talking about health inequalities. To, to focus not just on the importance of health policies, but also wider policies in relation to things like poverty reduction, housing conditions, the local and built environment. Um, and there was a report just published yesterday by our colleagues in the migration team at ESRI, um, you know, that looked at non-EU migrant women and found, for example, in relation to housing conditions, significant inequalities. And I suppose when we're talking about mortality as well, when we're talking about adult mortality, Thankfully, most of the deaths occur in older age, um, but people's risk and protective factors um, for health and health behaviours, um, uh, health promoting behaviours um, and conditions, then that, you know, is cumulative right through the life course. Um, so there's, you know, uh, I suppose a discussion to be had there about the importance of different policies at different stages uh, through the life course. Um, so finally, then, I'm going to um, sum up in relation to um, some policy implications in relation to data collection, harmonization, um, uh, and access. Um, so as uh, Bertrand and I spoke about, we used a, a variety of different uh, data sources in this report, and they're all detailed um, in much more detail uh, in the, the actual report. Um, and we would like to thank, in particular, the CSO um, and also the National Perinatal Reporting System the HPO and the HSE um, for giving us access to these data. Um, but I suppose the, the main challenge as researchers that we face is that these are administrative data sources. Uh, um, and, you know, they're, they're by definition, they're, they're not designed um, for sort of widespread uh, research interrogation. Um, so for adults, we're using data from the vital statistics, which is derived from the death certificates, and young infants is from the NVRS, which is derived from of hospital records. Um, and these are primarily designed to collect clinical information um, on death or limited information on demographics and socioeconomic status. Um, so the main issues then, as I mentioned, is limited, um, but also differing information on socioeconomic status, ethnicity, country of birth. Um, so you'll see we haven't made much of it, I suppose, in the presentation, but there's really different indicators, even of occupational group across these different data sources, which makes it really difficult to compare both over time uh, and across different groups. Um, for adults, then, there's an additional issue of what we term numerator-denominator bias. So this is when you're kind of, um, calculating the mortality rate. Um, your numerator, which is the number of deaths, um, comes from the vital statistics from the death certificate, um, whereas your denominator, the population, comes from the census of population. They're collected in different ways. They're reported by different individuals, and this can lead to bias um, in the calculation of the rates. Um, so we make a number of recommendations in the report, but briefly, I suppose that the two major ones that we make are in relation to, I suppose, moving to a system whereby we would have longitudinal follow-up after the census population. Um, and we've already piloted this approach, and um, the CSO have done this successfully after the 2006 and 2016 census, and Bertrand mentioned those data that were used after the 2016 census. So the idea is that for um, uh, everybody that dies, you link back to their, their closest census record. And that not only provides you with I suppose, information that's collected by the same individual, you don't have to rely on um, next of kin information um, at the time of death, which can be quite distressing for people to, to fill out. Um, but you also have a wider array of data and background data. So, for example, you have more indicators um, of occupation, you'll have things like education, you'll have the area that the person lives with. So you'll have a much broader sort of 
mentioned the socioeconomic status to work with. Um, but I suppose more practically, then we would recommend that um, data collectors um, would, if where possible, harmonize the indicators of socioeconomic status or ethnicity or country of birth that they collect. Um, and I know there have been, for example, in the new health information bill, um, the well being framework for Ireland, there is talk about um, trying as far, as far as possible to harmonize these indicators. But I think this exercise and this report um, ha has really illustrated, I suppose, the difficulties um, uh, that we face in monitoring inequalities um, with these um, various data issues. So um, with that, I think I will um, hand over to, to Helen um, next from the uh, IPH. That's great. Uh, thanks very much, Anne. I'm just going to uh, share my slides, hopefully without too much difficulty. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Anne and uh, Bertrand, for the presentation of the findings today. Uh, what I was going to do was really just give a sort of response to the findings from the IPH, who were the initial commissioners of the research. Um, our CEO, Suzanne, had already referred to uh, this report, which was published in 2001 uh, in the very early days of the Institute of Public Health, um, which was an analysis of inequalities and mortality based on data primarily from the 1990s. Um, when we were considering our approach to updating uh, analysis on inequalities and mortality, there was there was two main parts to it. The first one was really to update in a temporal sense in terms of what has happened over time and where are we now in relation to inequalities and mortality. Um, and the second one was to bring the thinking around inequalities into, into that analysis. So what we had realized that over the time period was that given the work of uh, Professor Marmot and the Commission on uh, Social Determinants of Health, that more attention was needed in terms of looking at giving every child the best start in life, early life mortality, maternal mortality in child populations, but also in terms of looking at ethnic and cultural diversity, uh, given the changes in uh, the uh, groups in the population at the time. And then, of course, COVID came in on top of that. So we were seeking an update in terms of what had happened over time, but also broadening out from where the initial analysis had come. So the first thing I'd like to do is congratulate the analysts, Katie Duffy and Nolan, Sheila Connolly and, and Bertrand on, on the publication of today's report. I know they had a lot of challenges navigating the data sets um, that were neither intuitive nor easy in terms of trying to answer some of these questions. Um, and the work today builds on other important analysis that explored how socioeconomic circumstances relate to a person's mortality. Um, some of these have applied individual measures of socioeconomic status, asking how a person's income or their occupation would Im influence their risk of death um, and what they die of. Uh, others applying sort of area-based measures, looking at geographies of disadvantaged or how li living in a disadvantaged area. So we owe a lot to an, uh, a range of different analysts in the ESRI and beyond in terms of their contributions to our understanding of inequalities and mortality as well. Um, the other area where we have obviously seen very significant uh, improvement in our understanding of inequalities and mortality have been focused analyses on population subgroups, uh, particularly the All-Ireland Traveller Health Study and the uh, vital statistics analysis that was done in that study, but also in other groups, particularly around early life uh, populations as well. Um, and the other sort of important lens that was added to our understanding of inequalities and mortality was where we had disease registries, where there were specific analysis done to say, uh, to look at inequalities within, uh, within particular disease outcomes. For example, in large registries like the cancer registry, where they did an excellent analysis looking at how social and economic circumstances affected a person's risk of getting cancer and also uh, their cancer journey and survival. So the, I mean, where we ultimately would like to get to um, is to be in a position where we know just describe and interpret the nature of health inequalities, but we also are able to then use that data to think about 
what policy measures can be used to reduce these uh, inequalities and also how those external events, which we can't predict and can't control, for example, the boom and bust economic cycle or a cost of living crisis or indeed COVID are likely to affect those inequalities um, over time. So, uh, I mean, some of the policy measures that we are even seeing at the moment in relation to cost of living, in relation to introduction of a new minimum wage may all have very significant effects in relation to um, health inequalities. Um, but it's very difficult to measure that when we don't have a good baseline uh, inequalities monitoring system. So Suzanne had earlier mentioned that we are a, a North South organization with an all island remit. And I would just wanted to share with you an example of uh, some of the health inequalities monitoring system that is in uh, Northern Ireland. They published their annual report there just earlier this year. But this monitoring system does allow uh, not just health, but the government to examine trends and in inequalities over over time. Are they are they widening, narrowing, or or staying the same? And what diseases and causes of of death or uh, attributing factors are uh, causing those changes and in inequalities? So one of the important tasks that we uh, did to some extent within uh, the analysis. Uh, and has been done in more detail in Northern Ireland is to unpack which causes of death are occupying the inequality gap. And the uh, example that I've shown here is example in terms of men in Northern Ireland, where there was no difference in the inequality gap in mortality over time, but the gap became increasingly occupied by lung cancer, chronic liver disease and mental and behavioral disorders. And the, I suppose another observation on that is in, in Bertrand's slide, you will see that the other category is starting to look a bit bigger than, than an other category should. Also, the all other causes category in terms of its con contribution is starting to look a bit bigger than it should. So we need to look beyond those big three of cardiovascular disease, circulatory disease, respiratory disease and cancer and start really thinking about what is happening in that other category. You know, why are we seeing mental and behavioral disorder? Why are we seeing chronic liver disease and these diseases rising up in terms of their contribution to inequalities and mortality? And given that these are the diseases that may be stepping forward as major contributors now to inequality, the given that they are uh, the nature of them, they, it's clear that they require public health response as well as a health service response. So some of you may never have not have heard of quality insurance because it's a long time ago, but I've brought it up here because it was the, the health strategy in the early uh, sort of 2000s. And within that, they did have specific targets in relation to reducing health inequalities through the linkages with the national anti-poverty strategy at the time. So quantitative specific measurable targets were set around a number of health inequalities, for example, reducing the life expectancy gap between the general population and uh, members of the traveling community, reducing inequality gaps in the in injuries and reduction in low birth weight. Uh, and where we are now is we have the Healthy Ireland Strategic Action Plan published in 2021 that uh, reprioritized health inequalities as an area uh, for focused action on one of the key outcomes from Healthy Ireland. We have this launch of care implementation strategy and action plan, which is also seeking to move to a more equitable system of healthcare access uh, and delivery, as well as a number of sort of disease specific and population specific strategies, many of which will recognize inequity, most of which will commit to address it, but very few specific actions and very few clear measurable targets in relation to the data. So uh, there's plenty of take home points from this. I suppose the good news that we, we shouldn't lose sight of is the progress that Ireland has made in reducing in having far fewer babies dying in the first week of life, far fewer babies dying in the first year of life and fewer child deaths in the uh, sort of age one to 14 category. That's a very significant achievement. And um, we are seeing some inequalities within that, which we need to, to further understand. Uh, we are seeing low mortality in our sort of new uh, immigrant communities. I think that's something to be celebrated, uh, examined and learned from. 
we've seen very significant reductions in uh, mortality from circulatory disease, and that is all credit to the uh, quality of the cardiovascular strategies and their on their implementation and the progress made in reducing smoking and many of the risk factors for heart disease. I suppose the main bad news is 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 probably that on many items we have no news and we don't have enough data to really understand uh, what has been happening in, in those other disease categories. Um, we have inequalities in mortality that would appear to be roughly similar in magnitude. So there hasn't been uh, evidence of reducing inequalities. They are uh, probably largely status quo, but it is very, very difficult to comment on trends over time. Um, I think the, the 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 lack of information on population level inequalities is sort of compounded somewhat by the deficits within health service activity. But we have a health information bill um, under development, which will be progressing work in relation to the electronic patient record and the unique patient identifier. I think we should build on this to ensure that the development in the health information infrastructure doesn't is certainly builds on good progress planned in the health service area, but also develops population health intelligence in the same way and in an integrated way. So that is it from me. I'm going to stop sharing my slides and I think I'm passing on to uh, Professor Dermot O'Reilly. Thank you, Helen. Um, just by way of context, I should say who I am. Uh, so I'm Dermot O'Reilly. I'm professor of social epidemiology at Queen's University, Belfast. And I've been researching on health inequalities for uh, decades. And I've been teaching master's levels on health inequalities in Queen's for 15 years and UCD for the last four or five years. Um, first thing I'd like to do is to add my congratulations to the research team on a wonderful and a wonderful report, a, a report that has taken a lot of effort, perhaps a lot more effort than it should actually have taken, because if the data had been of higher quality and more readily available, uh, it could have been produced a bit easier. But congratulations to them. I have no slides, but I would like to make maybe three points to the report and to what's been said so far. Uh, the first uh, as to why health inequalities in general is an intractable problem. Second point is I'll be trying to redefine uh, the problem uh, away from mortality and health inequalities and to more wider societal inequalities. And the third thing I'll do is maybe add three points as to what Ireland might do immediately or in the very near future that might help reduce health inequalities. And in doing so, I'm going to include three quotes from some of the leading lights on health inequalities, uh, both in Europe and across the world. So first point, the size of the problem. Um, as Alan has indicated in his introduction, um, health inequalities have been here with us for many decades and perhaps centuries. And it's an intractable problem for Ireland, but also for most countries throughout the world and even uh, Scandinavian countries, which have perhaps we would look to uh, for having little by the way of health inequalities because of their more egalitarian societies. And the reasons for this are, um, uh, have been well documented in other uh, places. The causes of health inequalities are multifactorial and some of them are intergenerational. And it's therefore likely that there is no one single solution. Uh, no one quick fix for health inequalities. Secondly, uh, and perhaps rather strangely, reaching and affecting and influencing those most in need actually in practice proves quite difficult. So targeting your interventions is difficult. Uh, third point is that most people who are interested in health inequalities, which probably includes most people, uh, I guess, uh, in this audience, are within the health sphere. However, um, as Helen has pointed out, uh, most people, uh, most action needed to fix health inequalities lie outside the health arena, e.g. in housing, employment, fiscal policy, and so on. And that means that we in the health arena are going to have to try and convince those in the non-health field to realign their policies and perhaps to reallocate their budgets 
which is of course tricky. And finally, uh, in relation to the political sphere, there is a significant time lag between any interventions that we collectively would bring in on a population level and the measurable outcomes that might arise from those interventions. And that's especially true for upstream interventions. Now that's particularly difficult in a political sphere where there's a four or five year cycle and, and politicians like to see a return on their investment fairly quickly. Point two, redefining the problem. Um, we've already moved from more inequalities and mortality to health inequalities. And now what about inequalities in society in general? And here's a quote from Sir Michael Marmot who he made it in 2020. He said, health tells us something really important about how well society is meeting the needs of its citizens. If health is not improving, then something is going wrong. And if inequalities in health are increasing, then inequalities in society are increasing. So therefore, maybe we should reconsider or reconceptualize health inequalities perhaps as a barometer for the wider inequalities in society. And if you accept that, then I might argue that it's hard to imagine how health inequalities can be fixed unless the wider inequalities in health are reduced. Or how can health inequalities be fixed, ameliorated, reduced, when inequalities in income or well inequalities in wealth and perhaps power are at least continuing or perhaps continuing to increase? Second quote in this, uh, in this area comes from Johann Machenbach, he made it at a conference in Belfast in 2006. He said that, and he was the, one of the leading uh, lights in um, health inequalities research on uh, policy uh, innovation uh, for the last 30 or 40 years. He said that fixing health inequalities is more difficult than previously thought. And here's the clincher, would require a policy change that Western societies could not make. So that's a very... A depressing thought. Point three, three things that Ireland might do in the immediate future to help reduce health inequalities. It's a first thing is that it's apparent that um, concerted political change is needed and it needs to be sustained over some period of time. And that's difficult. It requires either one party to be in, in power for a couple of terms or to have consensus across political parties about the actions that they wish to bring. I suggest that one thing politically uh, could happen is that Ireland should set a timeline for eradicating child poverty. Uh, and I do this on the basis of two things. One, that the, eff the effects on health uh, outcomes for children and infants will be more readily apparent, and that's good for policy feedback. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, is that any economic benefits of that intervention would far outstrip whatever costs are involved. The second thing that Ireland might consider doing is um, to uh, change so that there is universal free access to health care. And a quote this time from Margaret Chan, Director General of the WHO in 2012, and she said, Universal health coverage is the single most important concept that public health has to offer. It is a powerful equalizer that abolishes distinctions between the rich and the poor, the privileged and the marginalized, the young and the old, ethnic groups, women and men. It is the ultimate expression of fairness and would suggest it's time perhaps for Ireland to make this change. Finally, and again, agreement with uh, uh, the authors of the report and Helen, uh, who has just spoken very eloquently about this, the importance of changing how we monitor um, health inequalities. The management phrase, what gets measured, gets managed. Uh, and if it's not being measured, then uh, I, I suggest it's not uh, seriously being considered as a management for, or a thing for change. And I would recommend that there needs to be a system, perhaps a unit set up in Ireland that for the regular monitoring of health inequalities or inequalities in Ireland. And that's not just mortality inequalities, but also should include health inequalities, health behaviours, and also equity of access and use of health services. 
and I would fully endorse Anne's recommendations for the better use of the data that currently exists, and especially building on the, the wonderful data sets that are held by the CSO and the, the great potential that can be brought if to bear by using the census uh, better. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Dermot. And before that, thanks uh, to Helen as well. Um, we've sort of really broadened the discussion, I think, uh, as a result of the, the contributors. So I'm gonna welcome um, all, all the folks uh, back onto the call. Everybody can turn on their camera uh, if, if they would like. And uh, in addition to being joined by everybody uh, who did some presenting, uh, we're also joined by Sheila Connolly and Katie Duffy, of course, who are co-authors uh, of the report. So a number of questions have already come in uh, through the Q&A. Um, and I, I think we're probably gonna have two types of questions. There's gonna be the more technical uh, question where people wanna tease through uh, the precise meaning of the results. And then we, we might have a little bit of a policy discussion uh, as, as, as well. Uh, and can I just say, it's, it's, it's great. We've had over 100 people uh, on the call and, and still on the call. So obviously a, a great level of interest uh, in this topic. That's always uh, very, very heartening, um, I have to say. So the, the, the first kind of technical um, question, it, it came in from Caroline Fahey. And we just, I think we need to tease out the um, the, the ethnic mortality differences, and in particular, this uh, healthy immigrant uh, effect that, that, that is, is, is being discussed. But I think the first question is, I wonder if uh, DSRI colleagues could clarify, while there, you're talking about standardized mortality rates, that's the numbers per um, whatever, per, per, per population, but are these age adjusted? Uh, and is it simply the case that the Irish are just, you know, an, on average older and so more, so more likely to die versus, the, you know, the immigrants are, are a relatively uh, younger group? So it's it's just that critical point. Are these age on the, on the nationality spoke migration, are they age adjusted? So I don't know who wants to uh, take that. Um, I can, I can and start off there. So um, I suppose in relation to the adult inequalities, yes, they are age adjusted. And um, these are standardized mortality rates. So they adjust for differing age composition um, of the different ethnic groups or country of birth groupings. Um, and obviously that's really important in terms of the mix of our um, migrant or ethnic minority groups. They tend to be younger on average. Um, uh, but even taking that into account, they have lower mortality rates. Um, I suppose for the perinatal mortality analysis, what we showed you there um, are just the sort of crude mortality rates. Um, uh, obviously, for the, um, the perinatal deaths, you know, they're all within the first week of life. Um, we've done additional analysis, and maybe Sheila or Katie can talk about that, where we do adjust for age. Um, uh, and really, um, the sort of findings that we uh, show um, are pretty consistent. Okay, and ju just, uh, I don't know who wants to come in next, but it's just another technical point that's been asked. On the perinatal statistics, is that adjusted for the age of the mother? So, so I can come in on that. Um, so for the perinatal that. mortality in the analysis that we presented today, it's not adjusted for the age of the mother. And what we find when we look at the kind of the relationship between age and perinatal mortality is that it's U-shaped. In the perinatal mortality is generally higher in the kind of the under 20 uh, age category and then in the over 40s uh, for different reasons. Um, we have done additional analysis which controls for age. Uh, it'll hopefully be coming out as a paper later in the year, but there is an appendix in the report that includes some of that as well. So what we find generally is just what Anne said, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference to the, the extent of the inequalities or the um, the different groups. Okay, and we'll take one more, at least I'll take, I'll uh, pose one more te uh, technical question, if I might. On the COVID statistics, uh, where you're relating to uh, occupation, um, for people over the age of 65, was that a, 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 a assuming people are retired, not everyone retired to 65, of course, but is, is it the occupation you had when you were working for people who were older? Yeah, so my understanding in the census is that you're asked, you know, your, your status, and if you're retired or unemployed, it's your last known occupation. Yeah, so it was, um, as far as possible, it would recover, um, I suppose, people's usual occupation before they retired or became unemployed. So yeah, good point about the, the COVID matching. Okay, so let, let's, uh, some, again, people are uh, free to pose more technical questions if, if they want, but just sort of moving on more to the substance, what 
one of the questions that's been posed to what your expectation is about the the uh, immigrant uh, findings here. So the, the the relatively sort of let's say positive uh, picture around health status, or at least around um, lower mortality, is the expectation that that, that changes over time that it's sort of convergence on uh, the native population uh, and somebody is also asking the question then in terms of the the, the second generation okay the, the kids of immigrants um you know exactly what, what what's the expectation so just based on i i suppose it's literature is elsewhere do you have an expectation as to how that issue will will unfold over time who wants yeah. to jump in Bertrand, do you want to rely, rely start off? And um, Dermot, I know you've got your head up. Um, but I suppose um, in relation to um, our expectations, um, so um, I suppose it, it's worth pointing out that we have a relatively um, uh, uh, sort of recent experience of uh, internal migration or you know international migration to Ireland. It really only started in the in the nineteen nineties. Um, so if you compare our sort of patterns in relation to ethnic or uh, country of birth or nationality inequalities, um, uh, they can be quite different to other countries which have much more established populations. So I suppose, you know, this is the usual researchers saying we've got to wait and see, you know, if our sort of patterns uh, converge to those um, uh, in other countries. Um, but I suppose uh, in relation to um, sort of second generation migrants, I think one thing I will say is that really points to the importance of collecting um, you know, as many indicators of these kind of uh, ethnicity, country of birth and nationality as possible. Um, because obviously, you know, some groups that might identify as, as Black Irish, for example, could be born in Ireland and could have Irish nationality. So sort of unpicking those differences is really important. Um, we do know from sort of previous research that we've done using the Growing Up in Ireland survey, um, Use it uh, on sort of second generation um, migrants um, uh, and those from second generation families that you know there's a sort of a divergence in their experience across different uh, indicators. Um, but certainly in terms of sort of access and use of healthcare, and um, they tend to use it less, um, uh, which may sort of suggest sort of inequalities in their access to the system, uh, which may uh, impede uh, their health. Okay, and Dermot, did you want to uh, make a contribution on this? And I'll come to you in a second, Helen. I see you, uh, you've done electronic hand up, whereas Dermot did it the old fashioned way. So I should be egalitarian in how I respond. But anyway, you kick off, Dermot. <laughs> old fashioned is about right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, there's no simple answer to this one. And indeed, migrants will differ according to the reasons why they're migrating refugees versus economic uh, migrants, for example, and they will also differ according to ethnic groups. There's a wide literature about ethnicity and, and migrants right across Europe, and there's some research groups on this as well. Acculturation happens over time, where people adopt ten, generally tend to adopt the customs, habits, and practices and lifestyle of their adopted countries. But uh, emphasizing what Anne has just said again is that we must keep an eye on people's use or not of health services, health and social services, because language and other access barriers get in the way and may interfere with that. And lastly, again, this is where the data, in particular the census, comes into its own because it's hard to get information universally on uh, migrant status, how long people have been in the country, and ethnicity, which is always self-reported, and linking the census, not just to mortality, but then to health services uses, if you can, um, it would be invaluable. Sorry, and Helen? Uh, yeah, I suppose uh, not to give a sort of smart answer, but if we don't measure ethnic and cultural background, then we won't know. So that would be the first thing <laughs> I'll say. So, you know, uh, I suppose to see the, the, the rollout of the ethnic identifier within all our health information systems will really help us answer this question and unpick issues around nationality versus country of birth versus, you know, ethnic identifier. We've seen really good work on this in the UK. Now they have a different uh, population and history in relation to, the, to that, to, to there. So I don't think we can necessarily say, oh, well, we'll see what happens with the, you know, these communities in the UK and apply it here because I think it's quite different. So my first point would be, you know, let's get the data systems ready to answer these really important questions. The second piece is that I suppose it, it really is affected by a lot of external 
events that we maybe don't have any control over, for example, a refugee crisis, changes in immigration policy, all of those things will, will again change the distribution of those population groups and the, the experience that they will come with um, to, uh, to Ireland. But I do hold some hope that we will be able to answer some of these questions through some of the longitudinal studies that are available, like growing up in Ireland and even perhaps Tilda over time, if we keep on refreshing them and we make that commitment to invest in longitudinal studies, I think they'll give us they'll give us some of those answers. Yeah, thanks for that. You know, it's it, it's often interesting in that when, you know, over the years in the SRI, when we, we're, we're doing reports and you, you think you're doing your report to have a, a policy impact, but often the intermediate impact of the study is data related. Uh, and, you know, that, that that's kind of really where you hope to have the impact before you then move on subsequently. Uh, to look at some of the, uh, the the policy issues, and it, it could well be the case that when we sort of use this report to, in a sense, uh, sort of drive the agenda, uh, that that data is some of the issues that that, that we're going to be uh, looking at. Um, a couple of people have asked. I mean, th this finding around African-born mothers, and I mean, this is probably you know one of the more distressing uh, dimensions of the of, of the study. Um, can you tease out at all additionally what might be going on there? And there's a, a specific question in relation whether or not direct provision uh, is, is part of uh, what, what's underlying this. I'm not entirely sure what, what, what the person means in terms of the causal um, process or whatever like that, but uh, I wonder, have you sort of reflected on that at all um, while doing the report? Now again, who's gonna be brave? Um, I can come in on it a, a little bit. Um, so I suppose with the, the the data that we have, it's quite limited. Um, so we don't have other variables in there that may be driving this um, relationship. Uh, we do, again, in this subsequent piece of analysis, and again, it's in the appendix, have included socioeconomic status. So is it because the African mothers are particularly advantaged, uh, disadvantaged with, by a socioeconomic status? Uh, it explains some of the excess uh, perinatal mortality, uh, but certainly uh, not all of it. Um, the National Perinatal Epidemiology Centre in UCC, I think, uh, they do very in-depth work looking at perinatal uh, mortality, and they would have much more, I suppose, kind of explanatory uh, variables, so there may be something that they would be able to tease out uh, there, including whether the, the mother was involved in, in direct provision or not, but with the NPRS data set, which is kind of the national data set, which gives us all the information at the, at the national level, there's there's little data, I suppose, for us to be able to, to make those um, kind of saying what's going on conclusively. Okay, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left and I'm, I'm going to sort of pose uh, a, a question which is in a sense captures uh, a number of the comments uh, that have been made and this also arises out of uh, some of Dermot's uh, comments. But Dermot, when you were talking about the importance of essentially universal access to healthcare, okay, and I think, you know, we, we, we can probably collectively agree that that would be positive uh, for health status. But here's my question, would it actually be good for health inequalities? And the reason I ask the question is it strikes me, certainly uh, in Ireland, but increasingly in the United Kingdom and indeed in Northern Ireland, that when you have a, a national health system that is perhaps not as well funded and where you have waiting lists uh, building up, uh, those with money will always go and supplement the public with the private. Uh, and that, you know, so, you know, in, in terms of health inequalities, maybe it, it, it won't achieve uh, as, as much as, that, as we might think. And just then on that theme, we do have a fascinating uh, situation on the island of Ireland uh, that we have, um, you know, a national health system north of the border and the two tier system south of the border. But it's not entirely clear to me. Uh, that you have lower degrees of health inequality north of the border than the south. Now, when I say it's not entirely clear to me, I actually don't know the answer to that. Uh, but I'd be delighted to hear, Dermot, your reflections on that. Suzanne, if you're feeling brave, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to, to input, and indeed any of the ESRI folks. But Dermot, do you want to sort of kick off on that like ridiculously broad question, if I can say, <laughs> with uh, about <laughs> two minutes to go? Yeah, no pressure. Um, <laughs> yes, I agree. I mean... Um, I, I actually don't know how health inequalities compare north and south. The trouble about it is that many of the measures we use are composite measures. Mortality is a composite measure, for example. It includes uh, the incidence of disease, the severity of disease, and then lifestyle, and also access to or not of health services as well. So it, 
the death is the end result of all that combination of things. Uh, universal access not having to pay actually by itself will it will reduce some aspects of uh, uh, inequalities in health, particularly things like uh, screening services and preventative services, which tend to be people tend to put off. And, and if you have to pay, those are things that are not immediately apparent. You won't get your blood pressure checked. You won't get your diabetes checked just quite as regularly. And you won't turn up for your cervical or, or uh, colorectal cancer or whatever it is screening just as easily. Dental service is a really good indicator of that in Northern Ireland. Nice piece of work done recently and said that universal access plus evidence-based practice drives the excesses of the people who can't afford down, or if they want to pay for it, that's up to themselves. But within the public services, it drives it down. It gives a pretty level field. Yeah, fascinating. I, Sheila, I know you battled with some of the North South stuff recently too on the uh, some of the Shared Island work. Did you do you have a perspective on this one? Um, well, I suppose it'd be really interesting to measure it, but just the way things are measured, you, you can't compare it North and South. I mean, we can't really compare health very easily. So trying to measure health inequalities, which is another layer of complication. Um, and, you know, we had difficulties even doing that within Ireland. So I don't know. Um, and, you know, uh, obviously, you know, with the Institute of Public Health between Ireland and uh, Northern Ireland, it'd be great if something could be there uh, in that, that context, in that space. OK, we, we can uh, we can put it on the agenda. Suzanne, I don't know if you want a closing word at all, not mandatory, but if there's anything you wanted to add. No, really just again to sort of reiterate the, the great work that's gone into this. And I, and I really hope it's going to be useful to a broad range of people. I think also we're very biased on this, but I think it is important to remind everyone all the time that we do have to invest heavily in preventing where we can people becoming ill. You know, the universal healthcare is obviously incredibly important. Healthcare investment is incredibly important, but we have to try and keep pressure off the health services. Whether, you know, a lot of ill health is, is just pure bad luck, but there are drivers of ill health beyond people's control that are structural. And to keep that in mind all the time, because it's very, very difficult for policymakers to have to focus all, you know, on the immediate and the urgent. Life is like that. But we, we, we do have an opportunity to make people's lives better by making everyone, want, nobody wants to live forever, but I think people want to live healthier for longer. And I think there's insufficient um, emphasis on that sometimes just gets washed away. And the more information we have on how we could do that, I think it would just make a big difference. But as Dermot pointed out, the difficulty is it takes a long time and we have to be committing for the long haul to see the outcomes that will be super if we reach them but probably nothing discernible will happen for a couple of years. So it's, it's a stamina piece, I think. Very good. Thanks for that. Well, listen, we said we'd, we'd finish at a quarter past 12 and I see it's 17 minutes past 12. Uh, so we, we better uh, wrap things up because I'm sure everybody on the call has a busy day ahead. So once again, uh, congratulations uh, to my ESRI colleagues. Uh, sincere thanks to the, uh, the Institute of Public Health uh, for funding the work and engaging uh, throughout the process. And uh, indeed at today's launch. Uh, thanks to Dermot uh, for coming along. Some really fascinating insights there. I think we'll, um, we, we, we'll have to gather again at some stage anyway, I think, because I, I think we were at a certain extent only scratching the surface of some of the issues uh, that we'll need to uh, need to be thinking about in the, in the coming months and years. But anyway, with that, we'll uh, wrap up and just wish everybody uh, a good rest of the day. Bye-bye. So,